Thank you all for coming. So our next speaker is Jeff Crompton, and he's an experienced Linux Sys administrator working with the Trinity College in Melbourne, and his talk is called Testing Ain't Hard Even for Sys Admins. Please welcome him. So who needs testing? I'm a system administrator, I'm not really a programmer. When I write scripts, typically they're not very big. I don't split them up into modules. Uh, so I don't find that I really need to go to the effort of testing. It's normally good enough for me to put in print statements to see what's happening, and then when I'm finished, remove those print statements. If I'm feeling really sophisticated, then I'll use the logging module so that I aren't using print, I'm using logging. Um, but uh, I actually got into uh, testing because I use SaltStack at work and I started to write a script to use the SaltStack infrastructure and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So what is SaltStack? We've already had a talk earlier today about what SaltStack is but it's, um, it's quite a lot of things. It's pretty cool software, I think it started in about 2011 it lets you manage your infrastructure, manage lots of servers in a variety of ways. It's open source software, it's uh, got really nice readable code, it's got fairly good documentation, it's got a good community around it, um, and it lets you do a variety of things, such as configuration management, which has already been talked about a lot in this room today. Um, but just to rehash that briefly, if you haven't been here for those talks, the idea of configuration management is to make sure your servers are in a particular way. So you might say, I want sudo to be installed on all of my servers. And I want the sudo rules to look like a particular thing. Um, in SaltStack, that's called doing a high state run. In SaltStack, there are masters and minions. In a small environment, you'll have one master that controls many minions. Um, and with your high state runs, you would do that, you have an option of when you do that. You could choose to do that occasionally when you want to change your production environment because you're doing something in particular. But most people will tend to do their high state runs on a regular schedule, say every 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and so another idea of configuration management is it corrects configuration for you. If someone else has hand altered the sudo as file, then salt will drive it back to the way that you're wanting it to be um, to be expressed. And this is an idea of infrastructure as code. You write your code to specify how the infrastructure should look. I will note that I don't actually use SALT for configuration management because I got started with configuration management back in 2008 before SALT existed. So we use Puppet. It gives you other things. It gives you an idea of loosely coupled infrastructure coordination. SALT has an event bus. Uh, you can trigger events on minions and they get reacted to on the salt master by the salt reactor system. An example of that is you might have a website where a user is trying to create an account in your environment. You could trigger an event that this has happened and the reactor could then create a home directory for them on the file server or create a mail account on your Zimbra mail cluster. And the nice thing about this is that it's all very decoupled. If you change your web application, you don't have to change anything in that if you also change your mail environment. Um, this all sounds excellent to me and I hope one day I will actually implement this at Trinity. Um, one of the other things that I use for Salt is remote execution. Um, Salt comes with a command line tool called Salt and it lets you do stuff on collections of servers. And we've already seen examples of that uh, in previous talks today. So you can do remote execution, which I'm talking about, and here's an example of doing that. As you can see, the first argument is what I'm targeting, uh, and I'm going to use a shadow module to set the root password. And as you can see, it returns an output saying what's true, and if you are happy with the result of that, you can go on and target more minions. You can see I've got the minus G there. This is a different way of targeting. It's using the grain system to target all the Debian-like systems. And so, you know, once I'm happy that it worked on Testo1, I go and do it on lots of other servers. Hopefully you check these things before you go because with great power comes great responsibility. 
And that hash does not bear any resemblance to you know, the right hash. With the grains, you don't just have to use you know, the family. There's a variety of grains, uh, like CPU information, network information, memory sizes, and you can write your own grains. Not too difficult. Uh, you can discover things with salt, or rather, you can relearn things. Um, so I might sometimes use this just to remind myself of how many minions I've got at the moment. Or um, I could relearn, well, here's an example of that. Um, or I could relearn what versions of OpenSSL I've got running on those minions. And as you can see with this minion, this mocked up example, it's very old and needs to be updated. Um, there's lots of other things that salt stack gives you. Uh, there's lots of execution modules. I was trying to count them. I was going through an alphabetical list. I got to E, I was already up to 60. So I didn't bother keeping on counting. Um, you can write your own execution modules. It's Python code. If you're here, you're probably quite familiar with Python. Um, you can store the results that you get from these executions, not just on your screen, on your console. You can store those results somewhere else, like in a database or in a, a non-SQL database, which is also a database. Um, or you can write your own returner to do something else with them, um, to react to them. That's a silly idea, there's a reactor. Um, you can scale out salt quite well. I haven't done this, but you can have multiple masters. You can uh, control tens of thousands of minions according to what they tell you. You can do peer communications between minions. Earlier I talked about the event bus, that's communications from a minion to the master. You can apparently do communications between minions. I haven't. Um, you can control non-salt minions, both through salt SSH, so you know, Unixy environments that you don't have salt installed, but also through a salt proxy technique, uh, which I haven't used. But you know, if you've got Raspberry Pi uh, devices where you don't want the memory footprint of salt running on it, you can still control them with some effort through salt. And one thing you can do with Salt is uh, package updates. So they have execution modules for doing package updates. And in fact, that's why I was interested in Salt. Um, I was doing roughly monthly package updates and I'd been using a tool called Fabric to, uh, to do that. Um, once I got started with Salt Stack, I decided it would be a much better tool for doing this job. So there's package modules. Uh, it lets you easily say to whatever selection of minions that you want, that you want to update their package lists, you want to upgrade the packages on them, and you want to reboot them to uh, get you know, the, the kernel package installed and running. So this is an example of how you might do that. You might do a targeting all of your minions, a package refresh, a package upgrade, and a reboot. The first one is like doing an apt get update. The second one is like doing an apt get dist upgrade. And sys reboot is like doing shutdown minus r now. However, this might not be a good idea. I wouldn't do this. Um, you've probably got a salt minion running on your salt master. And if there's an update needed for that salt minion, the salt master is probably going to get restarted halfway through this. So it becomes, or at least in my mind, a little bit undefined about what happens to all of your minions. I certainly haven't tried this, but I wonder what would happen if once you've run that second command and there's all this output that's scrolled past, it might not include all the output because some of those minions might have restarted. They will reconnect to the master, but there are things that are in fly at the moment may not get returned to your running salt command. So you get this output that's pages long, you might not notice that half of them aren't there, and if you continue, you might reboot an undefined set of minions. <laughs> of course, rebooting your entire infrastructure is not a great idea. Because um, it turns out that servers have dependencies as well. My Zimbra host, our mail uh, infrastructure, is much happier if the mail host, the back end host, aren't rebooted at the same time as the front end host. Um, it's probably best if my apt cache host that caches my package downloads doesn't get rebooted at the same time that lots of other minions are trying to do you know, package updates as well. So in my environment, I wanted some control over the ordering of this, this work that I had to do every month. After a bit of experimenting around, I decided that I would solve this by writing a script and that would interact with the salt infrastructure that would let me do this in a more managed way. The script 
does a test.ping to discover what minions are around. It looks at a configuration file to get informed about some of the decisions I've made about ordering things. And then it goes through and does the, you know, the updates and the reboots. And in a script like this, what I said earlier about how I do programming doesn't really work. Print statements don't really cut it. Um, it's quite annoying if once you've gone through the script and you've worked out you're not a perfect programmer, you need to you know, develop it more, that you have to downgrade packages on servers so that you can run your script again to see what happens. Uh, it's also very slow to do that. And most of you probably can't afford to do that to your production environments, neither can I. Um, so it turns out that I need testing, which is really what this talk is meant to be about, the basics of testing. Uh, so this is a Python script. So when I started down this path, it's like, well, okay, what's the basics of testing in Python? So I'm gonna go through a, a unit test 101. Uh, unit test was added in Python 2.1, so it's probably available to you. Um, I found that there's three main components that I needed uh, for this kind of testing, and those are unit test, .test case, various assert methods, and the unit test.main. When I'm learning about something new, I like to start off with very simple you know, starting points, so the hello world of tests. And how you might do this is by creating a test directory, adding a file called test.py, and putting something very simple in it, such as what you see here. Uh, so you can see I've got all those three things that I mentioned earlier. I've got the unit test, test case that my class inherits from. I've got a cert, an assert method for doing a test, and I'm using unit test.main in my you know, under main to run the script. And here's what it looks like when you run that. As you can see, we live in a world where Python doesn't think that one equals one. I'm sure that we're all glad for that. So the test fails. Um, if I was to change the script to make so we're asserting that one equals one, then it would look quite different. It would look like this which is much less alarming, and that's really what you want when you run all your tests. You want it to look simple, and if there's something failing, you get the information that you need. Um, as I'm using unit test.main, I can ask it to run more than, I can be more specific about what I'm asking it to run. So here's an example of asking it to run the test things class. You might have tests that have multiple class in your file. And you don't have to run them all. In fact, you can even drill down into the test method that you want to run. And if you've got multiple assert calls inside that test method, because you're using unit test.main, you can even get it to run all of those assert calls. There's no real surprises there. You've got to run the whole method. Um, but you probably don't just want to have one test file with one test class. You probably want lots of test classes and lots of test methods spread across multiple files. But how do you run them all? And my answer for that was nose tests. From the nose test documentation, nose extends unit tests to make it easier to run multiple tests. So here's an example of running nose tests in my very simple case, where it just explores the test directory, finds all my test files, opens them up, finds all the test classes, and runs all the test methods. So now we get to how do we test my script. This is an extract of what my script looks like. Uh, some salient points are that you know there's a main method, there's a run, there's an object that I'm instantiating, and here we can see the test.ping that I was talking about to, to discover what minions are alive. So if I'm testing that, I don't want it to actually talk to salt. In fact, well, if I'm testing that, before I get to salt, I've got to be able to test it. How do I test my script? It's not a module. Uh, this is the way I test my script. I use the imp module to load that script into an object, and then inside my test case, I can you know, interact with that object to run it. So now let's get back to that point I mentioned just before. How do I stop it talking to a real salt master? And the solution for that these days is mock.patch. Mock is available uh, in PyPy if you're not running Python 3.3 or newer. It's been included in Python 3.3 mock.patch lets me replace the salt.client.local client, .client uh, which is part of the API I'm using to talk to salt, and replace it with something else that I've created. And here's an example of doing that. Uh, you can see I've created a local client object. It has a 
command method, um, and that's something that my script calls uh, repeatedly. Um, my command method, I haven't shown how I implement it here, but when I call it, I'm calling it multiple times with different job arguments, you know, a test.ping and then later a system.reboot. So, you know, there's got to be a, a bit of work in there to make it behave the correct way. So once I'm able to stop my script talking to salt, how do I know what happens inside my script? Like I've said before, it's not modular. I'm testing the whole thing at once. Um, and it doesn't, the run method doesn't return a value. And that wouldn't really make sense anyway because I'm going to test lots of different things. And one return value isn't going to express enough information about what happens in the internals of the script. Um, so the answer for that is mock dot magic mock. This lets you reach deep within the bowels of the thing that you're testing and to uh, find out what happened at that point. To me, that sounds like magic. So, you know, of course, that's why it's called mock.magicmock. Um, but let me show you some examples. So here's one example. Um, you can see the mock here. It's, you know, down here. I'm doing a magic mock. I've got a side effect. I'm going to capture some output when I run the script. Uh, and you can see I'm patching out raw input. So when I run this, uh, I guess the important thing to note here is the side effect. The side effect is an exception. What I want to know is, in this case, do I get prompted by the script early on in the script? So if I replace raw input with a mock that has a side effect of throwing an exception, then I can check if that exception gets thrown. Um, and what I'm checking, I've got up ahead, up the top, you've got uh, an argument skip, skip check. So if this is present, then I should get an exception. And elsewhere, I'll check if it's not present, then I shouldn't get an exception. Um, and not only am I checking if raw input is called, I'm also gathering the output and checking that the output is what I expect it to be. This is probably one of the first tests that I implemented on this particular project. Um, there's other ways of using mock. Um, you can look at how the mock object was called. Um, here I'm you know, throwing another side effect, but I'm not looking at the output. I'm just looking at the mock.call args to see if the way the mock was called, invoked, is the way I expected it. So in this case, do updates. Have I done an update on the minion that I expect to be updated? There's a variety of ways of using magic mock. You don't have to throw an exception. So here's an example of not throwing an exception. Uh, once again, I'm doing stuff and I'm asserting that it's being called in the way that I expect. So my do, do reboots is kind of happening later on in the script. Um, and here I'm just checking if the final call of do reboots was the local minion. I want my salt master, which I'm assuming this is running on, to be the very final thing to be rebooted. I don't want to reboot it halfway through the whole process. One thing to note that was conceptually difficult as I was getting into this is that patch replaces functionality. It doesn't wrap it. It's not a decorator which wraps functionality. It stubs it out and replaces it with something else. So the code that you're replacing is no longer run at all. In my case, that's OK. If I'm stubbing out the do updates method call, that's fine, my script actually depends on the results of that to determine what to reboot later. If there's no return value, then it won't reboot anything later. But in my test, I'm only checking at that point when the updates are called, what happens. It doesn't matter what happens later in the script. But for you, it might be important. If you're testing something to do with, say, an SQL database, and you do an insert, and your code depends on that later, if you kind of stub that out, that insert won't occur. So it's important in your environment to think about what you're kind of removing. You can have your mocks return a value. So you can work around that in some instances. And hopefully your tests are small enough that it doesn't really matter anyway. Um, so here's another example of using a mock and inspecting what happens. There's some complicated stuff here about filtering out things that I wasn't expecting. 
Uh, that's because I'm using mock calls to look at how it was called. Earlier, I was looking at mock call args list. In the end, my takeaway if you're using mocks is just look at call args list, don't look at mock calls because it, it's simpler. You don't have to worry about non-zero and len things. I mentioned earlier how there's my script looks at a configuration file to work out the ordering. So in my testing, I need to check how the script behaves when I do specify a configuration file and how it behaves when I don't specify a configuration file. So this is another view of my script that I'm testing. As you can see, it does a, a YAML load open on an argument to find this sequences file. So the question is in my test, how do I arrange that to happen? Unit test has a way of doing that. It's called the setup and the teardown methods. So in the setup, you can create this file um, and then tear down, you can remove that file. Here's an example of doing that. Um, I also learned later on that you can do it on a class kind of approach as a setup class, uh, which for some reason I don't remember I needed to do to specify the arguments for the test to say where there was a sequences.yaml file. Um, in my um, code, what am I looking at? In my code, I do an open of the Etsy salt minion ID file. And when I was starting to write this talk, I was writing on a laptop, this laptop that doesn't have salt installed, and suddenly all my tests were blowing up because there is no salt minion ID file. So I needed to work out how I was going to deal with that. And I came up with a solution, which is the wrong solution, and I'll show you that. Um, this is the wrong solution. This is uh, re replacing builtins.open so that when you open that particular path, it returns you know, a file object that has the information that I want in it. Um, and otherwise, it just you know, uses the default open. Um, and that works, but it's not the right answer. The right answer is to refactor the script that you have control of so it's easy to stub that functionality out. Instead of in the script just doing open, it should call a method that I can, you know, I can patch. And that leads me to a general principle that I, th I imagine people who have done testing before have you know, already discovered this. But for me, the idea is that you should patch as high as you can. You probably don't need to test the salt environment because someone else is testing that. If you're doing database calls, you probably don't need to test the database works because someone else is hopefully testing that. You only need to test your code. So it doesn't make sense for me to test or to stub, get into reaching into built-ins open. I should test my code. I should make my code testable, which is something that other people have been talking about a lot. Um, I've run a little bit early. Have we got questions? I have prepared some questions already, um, just in case there was no <laughs> questions. Um, so there's some answers already. Um, and, and the answer to the last question, unfortunately, has fallen off the end of the slide. So that'll just have to go unanswered. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, no, we have a question. Thanks for that talk. Um, obviously, with Russell, Keith McGee talking next door, somebody else has to step in to provide questions, so I'm glad you took the initiative. <laughs> um, I used to work with Jeff. Uh, so, question, um, does the script that upgrades all our Linux boxes work yet? <laughs> As in, as, in, yeah. as in, with this testing, have you been able to achieve what you set out to achieve, which is to make a reliable um, script to, to do that task? Um, well, not quite. <laughs> um, so one of the problems Tim saw was that we get halfway through the script and things would disappear, and I think I found that was due to a salt bug in earlier versions, so that problem's gone away. Um, but every time I run this script in production, on not quite a monthly basis, I, I learned more about the environment. So I can't say that I am confident that I am yet at the point where I can say, yeah, this works reliably, foolproof, the same every time. It turns out that uh, testing is good, but you learn different things in production 
than you do from testing. Follow up question if nobody else has questions. Um, testing is often done in conjunction with um, coverage analysis to make sure you've got tests that cover all the code. Yep. But that's still different from covering all the possible paths through the code, which reflect things that happen in the real world outside your code that are affecting the yep. code. Um, is there? A, do you have a sense of how much testing, uh, how much coverage of code you've got now with tests? Um, not in this case, um, but I was looking at testing in some other scripts that we use at work. Yeah, I can't remember exactly what that code was, but that was the first time I looked at the code coverage kind of tooling, uh, and in that case, I did fire it up and get it working, and it seemed to have some numbers that were 100% and some numbers that weren't. So. So in this case, no, I don't have coverage kind of results of it, but now I do know how to. So yeah, that'll be one of the next steps, uh, apart from just you know, giving it a go you know, next month. Um, have you added tests to all your existing Python scripts? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I haven't gone and retrofitted tests to all of my existing Python scripts. Um, but that does sound like a, a good idea for a talk for next year, you know, the story of what happened when I went, oh, well, I should have tests on everything. Let's do that. That surely shouldn't take too long. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.